And I, I just wanted to say also, Sam was selling Boy Scout hoagies, and they'll be delivered next week also. Um, you can still sign up today. They're $7 a hoagie. Italian. Jan. Good morning, everyone. I wanted to let you know that we are undertaking an incredible task for Lent. We are doing a unity blood drive. And so there are flyers that are over there that you may have picked up. And the theme is no greater love. And so if you think about it, in the palm of your hand is love. So please lend a hand for Lent and sign up for the blood drive. Um, and so these are the, the flyers that are there. Um, there will be some other ones forthcoming from Vitalent, who are the, the former uh, blood people here in Pittsburgh that were bought out by Vitalent. That's the name of the company for blood uh, donation drives. And the other thing that we're going to do, although we have a big Band-Aid on the wall over there, it's going to be covered with our hand tracings. And when we get a volunteer for a blood drive, we will put a big red heart in the palm. So please, um, as you're exiting today, let us get a tracing of your hand. And uh, you don't have to give your name, but they will appear on the wall at some point uh, during Lent. Thank you. I just wanted to let everybody know it is Communion Sunday. The Communion bread is gluten-free, soy-free, dairy-free, and nut-free. Okay? It's almost that bread. It's completely free. <laughs> um, Sunday school is having a bake sale, and um, we are up for donations for baked goods. Thank you. Next week at the Super Bowl. This week, Ruthie Hutchison is under the weather, and so we'll give her a little prayer. Ruthie Hutchison. Ruthie's not well. Anybody else have any news or needs? I have one last news or need. Uh, if you, uh, if the fear of God was put in you, six, five months ago, I came here five months ago, five months ago the fear of God was put in you, because um, I discussed creep and dump. Remember the day I discussed creep? Look at you guys nodding. <laughs> yeah, I told you you had six months to get yourselves together to get back into the areas you were supposed to be in. That's the creep part. Everybody during the pandemic seemed to expand in many ways, including their stuff around the church. And if you've just dumped something, get rid of it because, or take care of it. Put it back where it's supposed to go or take it home if it was supposed to be at your house, not our, our house. Uh, <laughs> because we would eventually be having a cleanup day. So eventually in March, I'm not quite sure when yet, we will be having a cleanup day where you're invited to come. And it does not matter, matter whether you're 2 or 92. We will have something for you to do that's the right skill set and ability level for you that... We need some decisions made about stuff around the church. So the first one is going to be the big dump day. And our friend Adam, our facilities director, is going to bring his big trailer. And we're going to fill it and have him take it away to some place that costs 75000 75 bucks for a ton <laughs> of materials and 85 for two tons. So we're getting rid of maybe two tons. You think that there isn't two tons worth of junk in this building? You are kidding yourself. <laughs> okay, so, creep and dump. Finish up, people. You got one last month. So if you're a last-minute person, your deadline is coming. Anybody have a last-minute thing? All right, so let's... Oh, I have a last-minute thing. Hey, Larry, wave at everybody. Wave. That's Larry. He's, he's filling in for Bobby. Or, oh, no, he's Ke Kevin. Thank you. I have it down here. Kevin Maurer. <laughs> right? Kevin. That's why he was just staring at me. <laughs> Kevin is filling in. He's our choir guy normally. But uh, Bobby couldn't be here today, so he's filling in. And we are grateful. So grateful. So welcome. So we use the time of the prelude to center ourselves 
and come into the right space in our own hearts and lives so that we can fully gather together to worship God. So let's spend the next few minutes in that time. Let us all join in the call to worship. The prophets of old spoke of God's justice, even when it was unwelcome. Who will hear their message? We'll listen and we will hear. Responding to God's call, Jesus traveled, preaching and teaching all who would listen. Who will hear his message? Christ sent disciples two by two to tell the good news in anyone who would welcome them. Who will hear their message? God's prophets are among us still, around the world and in these pews. Who will hear their message? Our opening hymn is Lift Every Voice and Sing, verses 1 and 3. You can find it on page 339 in your hymnal.
Good morning, everyone. And how's everyone? Good? Having fun sleeping? Yeah? Having fun coloring? Doing a nice job over there. Okay, so I have something in this basket that I'm sure you'll recognize. Legos, right? These are big ones. Giant Legos, yes, these are the big ones. I did them big so everyone could see them. Okay, so it's a Lego. It's one of the most popular toys ever invented. Who likes to play with Legos? I like to play with Legos. See, there you go. You like to play with Legos too? And Nathan does too, huh? So, um, so everybody knows what Legos are. And it's amazing what some people can build out of Legos. What are some of the things you've seen that are amazing? A dinosaur, sure. Also, pets used to play. What is it? Like robots. Robots. A house. Sometimes you even see like a uh, the White House made out of Legos, or a museum. All kinds of oh, cool things. Today, What's that? I saw Darth Vader. Darth Vader made out of Legos. Crazy. So, so anyways, when you build these Lego, these Lego sets, and no matter how big it is, you can only build it one block at a time, right? One block goes on and top, right? And so forth. So one block at a time is how you build something. As Christians, we have given our hearts to Jesus, right? Yes? We love Jesus. So but giving your heart to Jesus is only the beginning. Part of our job as a Christian is to learn more about him and about his ways. And just like building Legos, you don't do it all at once. You do it one piece at a time. Here's what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 10. For precept must be upon precept line upon line, here a little, there a little. So when you learn something in a children's sermon, we add another piece. When you learn something from Pastor Karen, we're building it up piece by piece, right? Oh, there we go. How about learning something in your Sunday school class, right? Okay, here. What's that? Add another piece. That's right. How about when you're at home and your mom and dad may teach you something about the Bible? Right? Sometimes you talk about your lesson. Okay, so we'll add another piece. Can you think of anything? Go ahead. When you pray to him? Sure. You're learning how to pray. How's that? Oh, well, remember... This is all in our mind. We're building it. <laughs> when you're at school, you try to learn. Right. So all these things build upon each block, right? So, and it gets bigger and bigger. Our knowledge of the Lord just grows and grows and grows. So that's how we build up our knowledge of the Lord, one piece at a time. And, of course, it's all based on one piece. Thing. What's it say? Jesus. Jesus. It's all based on Jesus. Okay, let us pray. Father in heaven, we want to know more about you. And we want to know more about your son, Jesus. Help our knowledge and wisdom to grow. And grow and grow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. You guys.
this can help. Please join me in the uh, prayer of confession and forgiveness. Surprising God, we confess before you now that we are a lost and wandering people, distracted by the world around us and easily diverted from how you call us to live. We are quick to anger and slow to forgive. We are quick to judge and slow to accept. We are quick to doubt and slow to understand. All too often, we place barriers in the way of seeing you in the world and shun opportunities to share you in the world. Hear us in this time of silence as we confess our individual peculiarities now. Let's bow our heads in prayerful silence. We pray to you now for support and compassion that we may always, however tentatively, proclaim the joy and hope of your promise to us that we are forgiven. We gratefully affirm that your love will always welcome us, comfort us, and heal us. Please be with us now in this time of worship and help us accept you into our lives as you will always accept us. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you all. Please feel free to share in the peace of Christ now with each other.
Let's pray. Intervening spirit, we take off our metaphorical shoes now, for we know we are standing on holy ground, and we are ready to start afresh. Help us to receive Christ's teaching, be renewed and strengthened in our faith, and change such that we are able to effectively share you with those around us. Amen. So our scripture reading today is Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Like last week's passage, there are indications that the two narrative moments in the part I'm reading today are meant to be read together. Linkages embedded in the text. So last week they included things like the two 12 years, the two crowds, the two females, the two skeptics, but also like the twin re reflections on revelation versus secrecy. So there's theological things embedded and there's vocabulary things embedded in passages. So this week it includes the question of acceptance and rejection. What does that mean? for both those near and far, the nature of power, scoffing, what does scoffing look like? What does it mean for the disciples to be true disciples and parallel the teacher? So you have the teacher and then the disciples. So things like that link these two pa passages. And there's richness in reading them together because we, we need to ask ourselves, what happens with Jesus in this passage? And then what happens with his most able disciple? Which is really different than what happens with Jesus. So Mark chapter 6 verses 1 through 13. Jesus has been at the lake. And it starts with Jesus left that place and came to his hometown. His disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue. So I want to break in here and say... I don't know if this was once or it was ongoing. It's not clear in the text, but he was teaching. And he's teaching in the synagogue, and then this conversation doesn't happen in the synagogue that's reported. It's like the parking lot conversation. Okay? So that's important. That's, no, there's nothing new under the sun. They also go out to the parking lot and have a conversation. So Jesus left that place and came to his hometown. His disciples followed him, and then on the Sabbath he went and began to teach in the synagogue. Many who heard him were surprised. Where did this man get all this? What's this wisdom he's been given? What about the powerful acts accomplished through him? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and is the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? They were repulsed by him and fell into sin. So, again, want to break in just for a second. The writer is not suggesting that they went off and they had an orgy. Okay. He fell into, they fell into sin. No. Somehow this conversation, whether it's in the transept or at lunch or in the grocery store aisle on Tuesday, went too far. So there's a place, absolutely, for concern and assessment and skepticism for asking questions. And then there is going too far, which is falling into sin. So Jesus came to his hometown with his disciples, and on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue. Many who heard him were surprised, so they went off and had a debate. Where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom he's been given? about the powerful acts accomplished through him isn't this the carpenter oh this is mary's son and brother of james and joseph and judas and simon and his sisters are here they were repulsed by him and they fell into sin so jesus said to them prophets are honored everywhere except in their hometowns and among their relatives and in their own households he was unable do any miracles there oh except except he placed his hands on a few sick people and healed them as if that's a small thing right <laughs> he was appalled by their disbelief 
So he called for the 12, and he sent them out in pairs. He gave them authority over unclean spirits. He instructed them to take nothing on the journey except a walking stick. No bread, no bags, no money in their belts. He told them to wear sandals, but not to put on two shirts. He said, whatever house you enter, remain there until you leave that place. If a place doesn't welcome you or listen to you as you leave, shake the dust off your feet as a witness to them. So the 12 went out and proclaimed that sh people should change their hearts and lives. They cast out many demons and they anointed many sick people with olive oil and healed them. Jesus in this story was unsuccessful. The disciples in this story, the 12, were successful. And yet, even as Jesus is sending them out, probably knowing they're going to be successful, Jesus' charge is to, to them is you won't always be successful. And when it doesn't work, just shake it off. Jesus had modeled walking away for them. And yet Jesus had also modeled being wildly successful all over the place, on this side of the lake, then on that side of the lake, and then back on this side of the lake. Healing, teaching, changing hearts and lives. Helping the whole person. The wild man became safe and clean and dressed in new clothes. The chronically ill woman becomes healed and reintegrated and affirmed. The death, death's door tween becomes protected and renewed and nourished. Jesus has effectively changed hearts and lives across the macro categories in these last few cha chapters. He's changed lives for Jews and Gentiles, for males and females, for poor and rich. None of that has mattered. Jesus has made a difference in people's lives. So we've seen Mark chapter 4 lived out. The word has been sent out indiscriminately. Some have responded well, and there's been growth and healing. Others, there's obstacles in their way, shall we say. The word has gone forth by Jesus, by the Twelve, hopefully one day by us, <laughs> to others. And those people's reactions that the word goes out to depends on them, on their soil, on their fears and hang-ups and prejudices. And so this is not the first time we've seen people repulsed by Jesus. They've been afraid of him and sent him off. Please leave us. Now, the idea that we can only present the gospel and people, how, what happens in people's lives and how they re react isn't our responsibility, really, is something that probably everybody in this building believes and lives. Presbyterians are not known for being Bible thumpers. Our evangelistic fervor and the in inability to stop is not our problem. <laughs> and yet... Jesus has said, tell people, let your light shine, scatter the seed, and then let it do what it will. We want people's hearts and lives to be changed, to be healed, to be saved from humans' worst impulses, to live into our best selves. I mean, that's God's goal for us, and that's meant to be our goals for other people. But people react. They fall into sin. Sometimes it's slander and gossip and negation. So they dismissed based on family of origin and profession and class in verses 3 and 4. Sometimes in the same attitude, they commit genocide. Who do they think they are? 
I mean, that's the same impulse, that negation impulse on a bigger or smaller scale. But the people's re sin reaction is not meant to stop us from trying to help them. We are meant to be helped and help people to be their best selves and to change people with holistic thinking. But we know, even we don't necessarily want change, let, about, let alone somebody who's not coming here to listen to this and to think about this. But I'll tell you something about the negativity in this passage towards Jesus and the one that the disciples are warned about. The weeds of the world are powerful. Weeds are insidious. They're ubiquitous. It's such a great wet metaphor, weeds. Whether you're a gardener or not, you know. We just have to keep pulling them out because they win if we don't keep pulling them out. So Jesus goes back to his hometown and is appalled at the people in the pew, at their basic disbelief. And yet their resistance can't completely keep him down, right? He couldn't do any healing, except, of course, he healed some people. But it does have a dampening effect, which is true. Negativity has a dampening effect. It keeps those very people who are negative from having what they themselves probably want, from healing and aid and hope and joy. That negativity I mean, people in the pews are the limiting factor sometimes. And much of the time, the people who are that don't know it. I have, as a pastor, dealt over and over again with people who grew up in the church and heard terrible things from the people around them or listening. And if we think it affects our kids, why don't we think it affects the adults that we're talking to? I have someone that I love. She is wonderful. She's a wonderful person. And I came to her church as a pastor, and she tells me this story about the worship wars in their church, right? Were they going to have an organ? Were they going to have guitars? Were they going to have music from a hymnal? Were they going to have a screen, right? They had these worship wars. And completely unselfconsciously, she tells me this story about her six-year-old, maybe seven, saying, songs in church shouldn't sound like a dirge. Okay, so <laughs> 30 years later, she's telling me this story, and she has no idea. 30 years later, she's told this story so often, it's a deep groove in her verbal reality. She has no idea that everyone from her mouth tells me that she fell into sin 30 years ago in the very way this passage is talking about. She does not know years later, despite being someone that worked in the school district with kids and had an education degree, she could not put together that a seven-year-old could not use the word dirge unless she was merely repeating the language that the adults around her had used. Because let's admit it, that is an archaic word, a dirge. What seven-year-old knows that word? So she had listened to the adults around her, kvetching, 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 and that negative vocabulary had sunk so deep and had been said around her so much that she used this language that was totally inappropriate to her age and stage. Now, I eventually said to her after I heard this story three or four times, because when you have a well-traveled story, you hear it a lot. I eventually said to her, don't you think that's a good story? <laughs> it was the first time she ever thought about that. I said, you know, you were home complaining. Like, you two were at the, or she and her husband were at the forefront of the worship wars. I said, why do you think your kids only go to a happy, clappy church where they sing, you know, songs that their, the parents didn't like going to the church because it gave them a headache because it was so loud, right? <laughs> you're, there's a straight line between that story and that reality in your life right there. But also, 
that she didn't ever put together in all those years of telling that story that something had gone wrong and that they were just being too negative around their kid. Nothing wrong with them like engaging in the the communic like the I don't want to call them worship wars because I don't like that, but not no problem with engaging in the dialogue in the church with adults about what we're doing. But they brought all that sludge home. Which is funny because those that couple are so welcoming. They're completely welcoming people. They invite people in. They're kind. They're, they invite people over for lunch. They're, it was just kind of funny to hear her telling the story and not have her having recognized it. I think it's important to know that because the people in this story that Jesus is appalled by are not villains. They are just normal people who go out in the parking lot and they have the conversation and they go too far. They just go too far. And that's what happens. People spout negativity and they go too far. They fall into, slu into sin. Sludge just pours out of their mouth. And they are somehow proud and justifying and satisfied with what they're saying instead of repentant and thoughtful and healed. But in truth, what is God trying to accomplish in us? How is God trying to help us? God is seeking to change our hearts and lives, to bring healing and wholeness and aid. And then to have us just turn around, try to accomplish that in somebody else's life, to be Christ's hands and feet, as we say, to bring healing and wholeness and aid to other people, to change their hearts and lives. And we are equipped for this work. Every single person in this building is equipped for this work in our lives and in the lives of others because we have the Holy Spirit. That is all they and we need. We are equipped. They walked out that road and they had a staff in their hand and they didn't have PowerPoint and they didn't have evangelism books and they didn't have Starbucks. They just took their little old walking stick in their sandals and told people what had happened in their lives and brought greater good to people. We are all equipped to do that. Success is not based on being known or unknown. Jesus was known and he was rejected. The, Disciples were unknown and they were going to be rejected. Jesus was unknown and he was accepted and Jesus was, or, and the disciples were unknown. No, the disciples were known. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> that was too complex to try to say. <laughs> you know what I mean. In both sex instances, they were accepted and rejected. Success is not based on status in life, ability to speak, programs, gimmicks, even gifting or power, right? The presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was with Jesus. When the good word is scattered, it hits all kinds of soil. And sometimes people just fall into sin and they can't see it. And sometimes people are good soil. They're ready for the message and hearts and lives are changed and they're healed, and they're made whole, and joy springs forth for you and for them, for me and for them. So go forth, you who are Christ's disciples. Be receptive to the good word and avoid the trap of sin. <laughs> go forth. Spread the word. Pull up a chair and stay a while if someone is receptive. And move on if they are not. It is okay. God will bring someone else into their life that is a better person for them. This is what God desires for us as true disciples. Amen.
the heart of our gospel is good news. Christ died for us. Christ lived for us. Christ came for us. Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. And we are grateful. I want to invite the servers forward so that they don't have to come in later. Jesus loved the people. Left and right, Jesus loved the people whether he, they loved him. He was appalled because he loved the people. And on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took that bread and he broke it. And he says, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took that cup after supper and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant sealed in the shedding of my blood. As often as you do this, do so in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim Christ's death until he comes again. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> we have an open table in the PCUSA, which means that you are welcome at this table. If you believe in Jesus Christ and you are his disciple, please come forward. Because we are God's people and this is God's food. And we want to be nourished. Amen.
Our great God, we give you thanks that you have brought us to this table. We give you thanks for the ways in which we cannot even fully explain that we are swept into the community of saints as we gather together over this table. We give you thanks for the ways in which we cannot even explain how we are nourished for our lives by this table. We give you thanks that you have provided for us in table and in fellowship and in love. We give you thanks that people have had opportunity to bring forth their financial gifts and their physical gifts and their physical being. And we dedicate it all to your service. We ask God that you would touch the people in our lives that we are worried about. We pray especially for Heidi Huck's mom and for the friends of Robert Deaglewald who passed and for Fran and for Becca and for the Ennis's house and the Ennis's with their house and for Ruth Hutchinson and for the Francisina family with their ups and downs and for Diane Reynolds. We know God that you know each of these people and you hold them in the heart and we give you thanks that we can pray for them now and always as we come before you together and give you thanks. And so we pray that today would have sunk deep in our souls and prepared us for our week. We pray that in the rhythm of Sabbath and active and Sabbath and active, we would have been renewed and that we would return safe and sound here next week to this very moment again. Amen.
me. Uh, there's an old, old song that says, that's called, Let the Beauty of Jesus Be Seen in Me. And if I thought you'd known it, I would have had us sing it, but who wants to sing a song you've never heard? But I think that's the heart of the gospel, that we are meant to be showing the world the beauty of Christ in us because we have a beautiful life in Christ, and we have experienced this God who makes us overflow even in the presence of our enemies. And so it isn't that everything's going to be great. If it wasn't all great with Jesus, it's not all going to be great with us. But in reality, we have a beauty and a wonder in a relationship with God that people need and want, and they need help in figuring out how to do that. And let's go forth and strengthen our own relationships with God and then share that with the world. And now may our God come upon each in this place with fire and ice. May we go forth in power and authority and know that we are fully equipped with the presence of the Holy Spirit deep within us. May we be renewed and strengthened through that Spirit's presence. And in all of that, may the world be changed and our hearts be renewed and we be found on the final day rejoicing in the ways in which God's beauty is natural to us. Amen. Okay.